everybody. Welcome to episode 31 of the Orchestra Podcast. We've been on a little bit of a hiatus. I had a fun summer as much as one can in uh, Corin times. Uh, today we have a good friend of mine, a colleague, a great teacher, Matt Grenzner, here with us, an orchestra teacher from Curtis High School. Uh, we've got a little bit of history going back. In fact, my wife was in one of his orchestras in the Puyallup District, where I also taught, which is so wild. <laughs> Uh, and he is coming to us today to talk about uh, taking over for well-established teachers and strong programs and how somebody in that situation can, can navigate the hardships of like speaking to a board uh, and dealing with the kids who really loved their last teacher, uh, which, which lasts many, many years. And that's, it's a good problem to have. Yeah, yeah, so the discussion today is going to be all about that. So welcome to the podcast, Matt. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And yeah, we've, we've, we're both in the same boat. We've got these huge programs and legacy people before us. And yeah, what, <laughs> how, how do we do this? <laughs> I remember when I, my first year at Curtis, this will be going into year seven at Curtis. So I was in Puyallup for seven years, um, got the phone call that a position was open, didn't believe it double checked it was told by multiple people that hey you need to get your application in and I did it and got it and yeah it's the program at Curtis uh, Joel Westgard was there for 30 plus years um, and the program is phenomenal there's three junior high uh, orchestras two high school orchestras um, the intermediate level we're on primary is intermediate junior high high school so a little bit different schedule um, but the intermediate music program is, it's mandatory for the kids to choose band, choir, orchestra. So we have oh, really? a phenomenal starting point. Um, so the, the, the first thing I noticed, I actually, um, when I knew I was going to get the job, I, start, I went to his spring concerts, his finale concerts at the junior high and high school to kind of see what, what the deal was and was amazed by the size of the groups um, and the caliber. and you know, just how we put the whole thing together. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, when I saw all that stuff, it was, yeah, what, what do you do? How, how do we make this work? How do we continue it? Um, you know, we have this huge foundation to start it. And then once they hit junior high, that was the first year where it was optional. Oh. So there's the first hurdle. Mm -hmm. Well, the second hurdle, I don't know, there's another hurdle. There's a new guy coming to town mm -hmm. and oh, we're going to the junior high where this, this program is and it's a new guy and I don't have to take this anymore. Mm. You know, right off the bat, there's those. And like you mentioned before, there's all the kids that love Mr. Westgard. There's mm -hmm. the senior class that wants Mr. Westgard as their last orchestra teacher. Now they have a new guy. So yeah, there's a lot of hurdles to jump right at the beginning. Um, and year eight of my teaching career seemed like year one all over again. And uh, that I had the exact same experience. And then w once we went online, it was like first year teacher, like <laughs> first year teacher <laughs> all over again. Yeah. That's cool. I was really lucky in that between Ron Jones and myself was two years of James Ray. Mm -hmm. And for the number of reasons that culminated in him taking a job at Western, he was really clear with the kids of, hey, whoever is in front of you next year is the teacher you get, and the program is about you. It's not about who waves the stick, and we're going to do our best to get a person in there that knows what they're doing, and he went out of his way to make connections between myself and, and the boosters, and it was as smooth a transition as I could have hoped for. And that's uh, awesome. That yeah, awesome. a lot of people don't get that. I did not get that at all. Um, I actually found out that I got the position the last day of school in Puyallup. Mm -hmm. And so I had gone to his spring concerts. Yeah, I guess I went to his spring concerts not knowing if I had the position or not, mm -hmm. but knowing I was in the final two. But I'm like, well, I might as well go to see what's going on. I didn't find out to the last day of school in Puyallup. I think UP had a couple more days. Mm -hmm. um, so not only did my kids not know my Puyallup yeah. kids, but you know, then the UP kids had no prep, 
mm-hmm. that Mr. Westgard, that Joel was leaving. Um, and I think the first thing that I did when I went in there, because it's like I've got so many kids that want Mr. Westgard and not the new yeah. guy, is I grabbed all of his files and I grabbed his syllabus and I changed the date and everything for the next uh-huh. school year, changed yep. the name and printed it off. I didn't change anything else. I looked at all of his rules and guidelines and regulations and how things were run in the class. And I'm like, you know what? This is the first thing I'm going to do. This is not my thing yet. This is going to be our thing. Yeah. Exactly. And I passed the syllabus out to everybody the first day of school or second or whenever we did it. And, and the high school kids were a little shocked. They were ready to kind of put up a fight and, you know, what is this guy going to change and what is he going to do? And I'm like, I'm not changing anything. I changed the name. I changed the date. Let's do what you guys know how to do. And, and that's I, great advice for anybody who, uh, I mean, this school year or watching this in the future is in a position where you're taking over for somebody who was doing a great job or in a district that has a strong program mm-hmm. is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. You know, and I was lucky to have, you know, both, I, I stayed a couple of nights before we closed in our house here in Port Angeles with Ron right. and his wife, and they kind of gave me the full download on the whole history of Port Angeles. <laughs> that was, was a lot to take in, uh, but but helpful. And whenever I have a question or or just I'm thinking about an idea, I can call James or Ron, and they always take my call. Uh, yeah. And my my goal was, what happened to make things be going so well? in this district and how can i continue doing whatever it was that you guys were doing Mm -hmm. Uh, and if there's any room to make changes that's it's not the first year in because there (laughs) clearly something was working well yep so you don't want to rock the boat uh some of my earlier gigs um there was a little more latitude Mm -hmm. um and I feel like I left behind in Puyallup um, kind of what is more my kind of program than even what I was doing at the end of the year in Port Angeles. Yeah. You know, my shtick is, you know, is as much of the real classical music as possible mm-hmm. because how many kids are going to go to college and actually play in the college orchestra? Right. And this might be your one and only opportunity to play the Tama Russo from the Tchaikovsky Serenade. And right. I mean, obviously you're not gonna do that with your freshmen, uh, <laughs> but, but your freshmen can do Vivaldi or Sammartini or, or one of the Stamitzes. Uh, and I feel like that's important. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. But still including uh, other, other voices and newer voices and, and trying to get in you know, the contemporary era, get some, some women in there uh, Suni Newbold has been writing great orchestra music for a long time. I think we have overlooked that one in the whole trying to get uh, female composers recognized. Perfect. I mean, Lion City is great for high school. That's, that's Suni Newbold. Yeah. I mean, it's candy. The kids yeah. love it. And it doesn't sound like it's candy to the audience. It, it sounds like oh, real yeah. literature. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, her music is always rhythmic, which I appreciate because uh, string players are notorious for being entirely unable to count. Well, uh, I'll tell a short story. So one of the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it things that I was really worried about with uh, the school closures was at the end of the year in Port Angeles, they do this all city strings review, really similar to what Bethel does where they cram everybody in the whole district into the gym at ELU. And at the end they play Ode to Joy and it's, you know, But they have this rose ceremony attached to it, too, where the fourth graders give a rose to all of the graduating seniors. And so when you're a graduating senior, you like look at this little baby first year fourth grader, and that was you, you know, six or eight years ago. Yeah, that's really cool. So uh, the the hill that I was going to die on was we still got to have all city strings. I don't care how it happens or what it looks like. We got to have it happen. And the, I thought we would all follow the rules and stay quarantined and and it would go away and get better. Uh, But the quote that I really love about the way that this has unfolded is it's kind of like uh, the, 
the way that the different states handled it was like having a peeing section in a pool. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we were closed off, but other places weren't, and yep. and it didn't get filtered out in the chlorine. <laughs> yep, exactly. So when it it came time that there would be no uh, all city strings. Uh, I was pretty worried. And that's also like our biggest fundraiser for like our uh, tours and uh, Port Angeles has gone to Carnegie Hall every four years since 1983 or something like that. Huh? Uh, <clears throat> so what, how the heck do I honor this tradition uh, when we can't even have more than five people in a room? Yep. So what, I, I came up with, uh, Ron and his wife, Debbie, reached out to me say like, hey, what are you thinking? Uh, and they must have, their ears must have been burning because <laughs> I was thinking about it. And so we went over and we, we kind of discussed the options. And uh, me and my boosters had discussed going door to door and, and delivering roses to seniors and having the other orchestra teachers play the Ode to Joy. That was my first idea, yeah. and and then Ron had a better idea, uh, <laughs> which was let's let's do a drive through at the school. Mm -hmm. So Ron and I put on our concert attire, and I've kind of made a name for myself for having this blue suit with the blueberry shirt and the the sparkly blue shoes. You've all seen it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't unsee it. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> uh, well. Uh, I'll finish one story at a time here. Uh, and Ron uh, wore a, a matching blue turtleneck under his tux, which was really cute. Because if, if, if you don't know, the, the Port Angeles High School Orchestra is also known, uh, thanks to Ryan Dudenbostel, as the Big Blue Beast. Uh, because despite our school colors being green, the girls wear blue dresses and the boys wear blue cum cummerbunds and blue ties. Uh, Part of that is because it looks good on stage and also it matches the drapes at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> uh, and, and most importantly, it's memorable. Yes. Because when you're at State over in Ellensburg, you know that that's Port Angeles. Yep. <laughs> and oh, the blue dresses are here again. <laughs> uh, and and uh, much like the sparkly blue shoes, you, you can't unsee it. Uh, right. And and that being memorable is part of what made Port Angeles so great. Uh, so anyhow, we're, we're doing this drive-through rose ceremony and every kid came through. And since the fourth grader couldn't be there, uh, the seniors had had Ron, because mm -hmm. that was his last year teaching and they had gone to Carnegie Hall with him. Mm -hmm. and, so that, and it was all a surprise to them. So I just said, we're doing drive-through rose ceremony and I, I have a couple of seniors that uh, were really team wrote all by the end uh, yeah. that I counted on like, hey, can you text everybody uh, I don't, on TikTok or direct message on Instagram? <laughs> uh, however the kids communicate yep. these days, that's how old I am now. Page <laughs> <Hates> the kids. <laughs> uh, to get everybody to show up. And I think there were only like three out of the 35 seniors that didn't show up. That's great. Uh, and Ron gave him a rose, and then I, I drove over and met James, mm -hmm. because James started most of them when they were fourth graders. Right. And he was all of their middle school directors. Mm -hmm. well, maybe a couple of them had um, Sabrina Scruggs, if, if you can remember that name. Uh, but they'd all had James at some point. Yeah. And so in a tradition that Stephen Picard um, helped me start for myself, was to write a handwritten note to the seniors. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was at Rogers, that was a much shorter list. Right. Uh, <laughs> and and you, you kind of, I'm sure if you do anything like this, you have a little formula of things that everybody gets, of you know, what an honor it was to have you in orchestra, and then memory of you and me, and then insert, you know, cut and paste that everybody hears, just yep. so that I don't have to write 35 individual cards. Exactly. <laughs> but I got Ron and James to sign all of these cards. That's awesome. So every kid got a, a personal message with all of our signatures on it. And uh, the 30 minutes before the ceremony started, 
uh, we did a Zoom together where we mm -hmm. said why the class of 2020 is so important to us. And then we, through Studio Magic, passed a rose from one to another. <laughs> <laughs> Disney magic. <laughs> yeah, so that they got, you know, that little spiel while they're waiting in their car to, mm -hmm. to come and get their rose. That's really and cool. What I didn't expect was the principal uh, showed up and took some pictures. And, and he was nice to me, very supportive. He had, uh, I think his kids were in the orchestra. He went on one of the Carnegie trips and mm -hmm. he, he plays in a, a band somewhere in Squim, like a, they do like covers and he plays bass guitar, which is really cool. Nice. <laughs> uh, but at the end of it, it, I was talking to one of the senior's parents and she said, this is the first time the kids have seen each other since March. And this was in June. And so the, the kids were breaking the rules over in the parking lot, kind of congregating and talking to each other and, <laughs> and I can do anything about this. And, uh, you know, we, we just kind of let it fizzle out because yep. of all that got taken away. Then it was outdoors anyway. Uh, right. But just so rough to have that tradition taken away. And I'm glad that we came up with the plan that we did to give them something. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but that it's so important for anybody out there who who's in our position at at either point that that you keep those traditions at least for a while. If you see one that isn't working, let it go for five years. Honestly, yeah, let it. Yeah, the moment you said tradition and you started talking about your rose ceremony, I, you know that the word just sticks because that's what we're walking into. You can call it a legacy. You can call it whatever you want. It's you're walking into a tradition something that's been set there for however long it's been. And you, you don't fix things that are broken. You let it go, you let them, you, you ride with it. And then you start tweaking things along the way. Like I said, you know, the first year, I didn't change the syllabus at all. We went with exactly what was planned the year before. Um, I communicated with my colleagues uh, at the intermediates, Chris Burns and Andrea Schmidt and you know, I was like, okay, well, what is, you know, what does my job look like from your guys' point of view? What are things that I need to know about? You know, and we had uh, great meetings before my, you know, that, that summer before I started and, you know, got some things figured out. We tweaked a very few things that first year. Yeah. You know, we, have, we don't have an all city concert at the end of the year like you do, but we've got a, a district festival Yeah. Uh, in the middle of the year. Um, and it's, it's the top groups from, all of the schools it's not everybody but it's you know same same deal um and they always did it in the gym high school gym floor everybody was set up at the same time and it was just you know it, it was organized chaos on the floor <laughs> well <laughs> and in port angeles it's, it's to the point where it was i think three or four years ago the fire marshal came in and said <laughs> too many people fire hazard and so we have to have two concerts now for all city wow uh, because when you include all of the fourth graders and the fifth graders and the sixth graders, mm -hmm. it's, I think, in the last five years, the lowest it has ever been was 846 total string students wow. in the Port Angeles School District. Yeah. Um, which uh, you were talking about your, your colleagues, and that's something else that, that needs to be considered when stepping into this position is who, who's feeding you and if the program is so strong, they're probably getting the kids off to a good start. Yes. Because you don't start in, you know, seventh or eighth grade or whatever grade yeah. uh, you, you happen to, the youngest grade that you teach. Yeah. Uh, they've had somebody before you mm -hmm. that has been doing good work and you want to know how you can scaffold what you want to do on top of what they've already been doing. Exactly. And, you know, I've even helped them a little bit. All right, I, I don't remember if I helped them or just talked to them. They switched method books at one point, you know, so we were having that conversation and, okay, what can I expect when I get them as eighth graders? And, yeah, you know, yeah, you, you it's not just my world of eight through 12 and two buildings. It's their world of five through seven in their two separate buildings. And, you know, how do we, how, how do we make all of that work when we get well, them in eighth grade? If I changed anything at all, my first year in Port Angeles, was the, we do a, a really good job of utilizing the essential elements books mm -hmm. 
and, you know, getting not just, you know, taking piecemeal, but really like using them as a, a teaching tool and that's your repertoire. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially in book two where you have, you know, songs in three part harmony ish. Mm -hmm. And if you want to count bass, it's like three and a half. Right. <laughs> uh, so I figured if the kids are used to method book song or like technique method book song, warm up method book, mm -hmm. uh, when they get to the middle school, because I, I teach the eighth grade orchestra, if they're expecting method book, well, I, I don't have a lot of room in my routine for method book, but I love the Christopher Selby book mm -hmm. of uh, Habits of a Su Successful Orchestra Musician. And I, I gave every kid just kind of the bits of it that I think are useful, because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not really decipherable if a kid's just at home by themselves with that book. No, it's, it's there's, not. Yeah, they, there's no way they're going to make sense of it. So uh, I put a shifting exercise and then one of the, the key exercises where it has the, the tuning exercise, the chord yes. tuning exercise, and then all the scales. Yeah. And so it's like shifting and then uh, one of the keys. And I just kind of did, you know, G, D, C, A major and a couple mm -hmm. of the black keys and yeah. uh, G and D minor. And then the corrals in the back. And so it's just kind of like, how much, how much time do, can I trust these kids to stay focused on literature? And let's fill whatever that empty space would be at the beginning mm -hmm. with the, the technique. Because if I want to be able to do the Tchaikovsky Tema Russo uh, with the symphonic orchestra, which is non-auditioned, mm -hmm. 10th through 12th grade, and I've maybe got eight kids out of 109 in that group that take lessons that I know about. Yeah. Um, they've got to have some technique first. And I, I'm, I'm sure you, you're doing similar things. Yep. And, and they definitely fought me a little bit on the, we're in eighth grade. We don't have to do method book anymore. Like, <laughs> well, viola section, can you play C sharp? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> So we're going to still try Sorry. <laughs> More than one? Turn to corral number three. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, yeah, the method books, I finally found the one I like, and it's the Selby book, and he's got the middle level string musician. Yes. Here. And I use that at the junior high, and then I use the other one at the high school. And mm -hmm. my seniors, my top audition group, they, we all start with those warm-ups every day. Okay, pick yeah. out this scale. We go through the tuning, the corral, the, all of those bits and pieces. That's our warm up every single day. And, you know, one of the biggest things, I think one of the biggest hurdles getting through the first couple years um, was the format of the classes I had at the junior high. Because I had three classes and there's this top group uh -huh. that my first year teaching at the junior high, the top audition group was 86 students. Oh my God. And so coming from Puyallup, I started with my first junior high orchestra with 35. Uh -huh. By the time I left, it was 65 over the span of seven years, and they wouldn't give me a second class for it until after I left, and the new teacher fought for it because they're like, what's going on? And so they finally got, you know, that's when Puyall went to the double orchestras at the junior high. Yeah. So walking into Curtis Junior High with three levels of classes, the mm -hmm. top group being 86, I can't remember what the middle group was. The lowest group, which was called String Tech, mm -hmm. was 20, 25 maybe. And I'm like, okay, cool. This is like, and Joel had placed all the kids too. So I'm walking into pre-placed classes. I know nothing about. He, <laughs> Joel actually left me, it was three or four boxes of cassette tapes <laughs> and a cassette player. <laughs> And said, I've already placed the classes for you, but if you would like to re-listen to all of these auditions. On cassette? On, on cassette. He would send this. Why don't you leave your Betamax, Joel? <laughs> I was looking for the eight track from his car. Like, <laughs> he had a closet full of cassette recorders and, he, and blank cassettes, like unopened packages of cassettes. Mm -hmm. And he would send the kids in the, the, the spring into the practice rooms, here's your audition material, record it as many times as you want and turn it in when you're done, write your name on a sticky note and put it in the box. And I had three or four of these boxes just chock full of audition tapes. And I, 
no thanks. The classes are already set. I just kind of scooted all those into the trash can and I went with the classes he had. But the biggest hurdle that year was this whole notion of tiers at the junior high level. Yeah. There's this elite and it was called advanced orchestra. So it already had the title of we are up here. And then there's intermediate right. orchestra and then there's string tech. Yeah. I loved the foundation of the three levels, but the names weren't helping me at all. Uh -huh. The class sizes weren't helping me at all. And then there was the parents. My kid doesn't belong in string tech. Well, yep. you know what? Oh, Actually, yeah. this is going to be perfect because we're small. We're going to get a lot done. And by the end of the year, they're going to be, you know, they're going to catch up so quick. So I fought that for the first couple of years. And I finally, uh, my first year, not changing a whole lot of anything. And yeah. then always communicating with the junior high principal about, hey, these are issues coming up. This is what I'm seeing. These are you know, do you see all these parent phone calls and emails that I'm having to deal with? Um, I don't know how Joel dealt with it, you know, um, but I was getting a lot of it. And it was probably because I was the new teacher too. Yeah. But I can't remember if it was the second or third year. Um, I finally at least switched the names of the classes, but it was still three classes. Mm -hmm. That didn't help any <laughs> because there was still the kids could tell. And so the, the next time I switched, I think there were like three years in a row where I actually changed the format of the classes. Mm. Um, it started with like the names. The next year I went to an eighth grade only group, a ninth grade only group, and then the top audition group, which that worked numbers wise for a year. Mm -hmm. But then the ninth graders realized that they were the lowest set of the ninth graders. You know, so they were, oh. they were, the, the bottom ability level mm -hmm. of their class. So they start those, that group of ninth graders kind of realized that they were almost on par with that eighth grade only class. Well, and, and that's the beauty of the way that things work in Port Angeles is mm -hmm. that you are with your grade level until you make it into chamber orchestra at the high school. And yeah. it is extremely rare that there is a freshman that makes it into chamber orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This this next year, last year I just had one, mm -hmm. but setting it up that way makes it really kind of a, an. I don't deal with why is my son or daughter in advanced orchestra. Well, advanced orchestra is the eighth grade orchestra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. End of argument. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we had a couple of when we were doing scheduling like parents who incoming seventh graders who think they're better than everybody else who wanted to be in the top group. And that may be the case that they play at that level. Um, but did, did you do to come you symphony when you were a kid? I did every youth symphony. I'm, I'm from Everett. I went okay. to the Buckle Teal. You're from so. up, up North. So up north. Uh, yep. did you go to Kamiak? No, I went to Mariner. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the poor side of the district. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so uh, it, it in Tacoma U Symphony, mm -hmm. they rarely do they put a kid out of their age level, right? So uh, a good friend of mine now, his name is Jonathan Gall. I don't know if you've heard of him, uh, but he and I were taking lessons from Sven uh, at about the same time before I was at PLU when I was in uh, high school. And when he was like 11, he was playing the Vinyaski Scherzo Tarantel, like from memory and like better than Heifetz. Yeah. And he, he had his audition at Tacoma Youth Symphony right before me. <laughs> and, and I think I did like the first three minutes of the first movement of Corn Gold, like barely. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he was still in, you know, the, the debut orchestra and I was still in young artist orchestra with you know those sophomore age kids right uh because you you need not just you need leaders that are that age but the kids need to like socially develop with people their own age as well and so when you have a, like a competitive group a little too young it, it seems like you're working with what you got or working it out and obviously it worked uh right. you wouldn't have the program you have if it didn't work to some extent 
Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a danger into having a competitive ensemble before you get to high school. Mm -hmm. And that, the, like you said, those ninth graders think they're the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. And nobody should think that. No, 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 no. And this, I mean, so this continued. So right now, the junior high, I've got it formatted the way I, I, I found it's worked. Mm -hmm. I love the eighth and ninth grade classes separate and then the combined, you know, advance. But it just, it didn't work out for the, those junior high brains. So the two other classes I have are an eighth and ninth mix. Mm -hmm. It's just everybody who's not in the top group but they're split into two classes. And so we do the same literature. We combine for one big group for the concerts. Uh -huh. And that's, it, it's not, I don't know if it's, it's exactly what I want, but I found it's what works best uh -huh. for me and the students. Well, and you got to serve your clientele. Mm -hmm. If you okay. have a lot of parents and students who expect and demand that there is a, an elite ensemble at mm -hmm. the middle level, then you've got to have it. Well, and here's that, the tradition again, Gresham. Oh, which is now the, the yeah. artist formerly known as Gresham. Now it is, yes. <laughs> the <artist>. <laughs> <laughs> Write that one down. Um, and we have the, the wall of trophies and junior high full orchestra was Curtis Junior High's baby. How many other people even have that? You must be the only performing group in that category. No. There's, there's another group, there's another program up in Bevel, Be uh, Bellevue, Odell Middle School. Oh. So it was Curtis Junior High and Odell Brock two now? groups. What's that? Is that the school Chase is at now? Yes, Chase Chang is there now. Um, it was Barney Blau. Um, and so oh. Oresham every year in that division, it was three junior high groups. It yeah. was Odell's two groups and Curtis's one. And, you know, Curtis trophies were first or second place every single year mm -hmm. so it was that was the tradition that I was walking into and there's no way I'm saying no to yeah. this trip yeah and it was an overnight trip out of state and so I had to jump on the bandwagon real quick and figure out okay how do we get this to work how do we get this done um and we did it for five years yeah and five years four years can't remember it was it was yeah around there um, and then some students decided to make a, a very, very bad choice during the trip. Um, and I, I was already trying to figure out how to get into Western's program anyways, mm -hmm. because I just didn't like the environment of the Gresham trip and the rivalry between Curtis and Odell. I don't, I'm not a competitive, I'm not a rivalry type person. Well, I, and I don't think that's particularly helpful. I, not at that, not, especially at the junior high age, I don't think it is, especially in our program that, you know, there's not a lot of middle school, junior high, full orchestras that can perform, you know? And I, I had started one in Puyallup, and it's, I think it's, it's finally fizzled out. I'm not sure. They, didn't, they haven't had concerts the past two years, but, yeah. you know, I, I didn't like... The competitive nature especially at that age level of kids and so I was already trying to find a way to get into westerns and kind of start new start fresh um luckily I guess um a student made a bad choice during the overnight trip and that was you know my yeah. out to say okay we're done well it was like I think the principal was actually kind of happy too on the the list of things that that I brought with me uh, that was totally me and not, you know, me and, you know, James Ray's clothing or, or Ron Jones clothing, uh, <laughs> is that whenever I go on a trip, and, and this is something that uh, my good friend and colleague Stephen Picard does as well, mm -hmm. is when you get on the bus, you tell everybody, don't be the reason we never go on this trip again. <laughs> and I leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And the couple of times that there have been close calls, I, I kind of pull the kid aside and I say, are you about to be the reason we never take this trip again? Mm -hmm. Yep. And it, from all of the totally wild stories that Ron told me from back in the day, taking kids to Gresham and Western and New York, uh, and there were some pretty hilarious moments. They never had to send anybody home. Nope. <laughs> because it, it, it was just understood, the, and the, the way that the program is built of the, 
by the time you go to Carnegie Hall, you've at least once had an overnight trip with the whole orchestra program. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the freshman, symphonic orchestra, and chamber all play at what used to be Gresham and now is the, the Western trip. Mm -hmm. uh, so they've got that overnight experience where they put the tape on the doors and, yep. you know, the you got to make your bed before we leave, even though the... <laughs> I, I don't know if the the cleaning staff really want that, <laughs> but it it you know it, it makes the kids take it more seriously. Exactly, there's there's standards, and so when you get to Carnegie Hall, you're not worried about checking the tape on the door, right? Because you've kind of figured out who your problem kids are, right? Yeah, already, mm -hmm. and it, especially if it's a you know junior senior, they've been on the overnight trip three times now. <laughs> yep. So you know who to look for. <clears throat> Doing that with a junior high group or a middle school group, that just sounds terrifying. I don't was, think I would do an overnight with a middle school group. No, and, and I'm glad I don't anymore. And uh, there's, there was a big difference going from Puyallup to University Place. You know, oh, yeah. I mean, the, the structure was different, the programs are different, the clientele is different, but like, I mean, the, the tradition was one of the big hurdles that I, I faced. It's like, how do I get going with this? How do I keep it going? You know, how do I even understand what it is they're doing? Um, well, how do you honor it before you, before you take the next step? How do you honor the tradition? Because mm -hmm. clearly it, it worked to a, a huge degree. Yeah. Whether or not you ethically, morally, philosophically agree with it <laughs> right. is, you know, that's, a, that's not a first five years thing that you tackle. Yeah, no. And I mean, one of the biggest things that, that was hard for me is in Puyallup with my one junior high orchestra, you know, we, we would do 12, 15 songs a year, you know, over the spread of all of our concerts. In UP at Curtis at the junior high and high school, we were doing 12 to 15 pieces a concert between all of the groups. Yeah. So now it's like, okay, I'm like, I'm... <laughs> You're sort of a repertoire. <laughs> I know. It's like, Oh, what do I do? What, I need more music now. You well, know, that's... Uh, for, for those of you who, who don't know the whole history, Ron Jones taught 43 years oh. at Port Angeles High School. Mm -hmm. and, and he knew really well the pieces that he knew how to teach mm -hmm. and what the groups could handle. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was given lots of kind of points of what the kids might be able to handle and I kind of ask questions about um, you know how are there sufficient violins that could play in you know a sixth position you know high D high G with a fourth finger kind of thing yeah uh, could they do a one octave a major scale starting on a on the E string uh, you know to what degree is that so I could kind of get a gauge of what is possible. Like, are we stuck in grade three territory? Right. Or uh, if you're lucky, you get kids who, whether or not they're ready to play that music, they want to. And, and I, I have a number of kids who are like that, which is uh, something really cool about the clientele in Port Angeles is they know that there is, uh, oh, th this is what I was thinking about earlier, um, in at PLU reading the um, in my string pedag pedagogy class reading the Hammond and Gillespie uh, high school strings textbook I forget the title of that book it's a uh -oh. small spiral bound uh, like I'm you probably have it on a shelf somewhere I, I, out there I I, I, think, <laughs> I think I, I think I know what you're talking about for teaching strings maybe is what it's called yeah I can't remember but it, it, it's it's yeah. brilliant and they talk about the different uh, systems of recruitment and retention. Mm -hmm. And the most effective by far is, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, not track record, or a, I suppose a history of excellence. Okay. Established excellence. Mm -hmm. Because, um, and, uh, concurrently with the story, I did some of my practicum hours with Chip Schooler before okay. he retired. Mm -hmm. and, and I saw him with the high school and I saw him with the beginners. Mm -hmm. And 
you can see the way that he was teaching the beginners so that he would have the high school kids that he needed. Mm -hmm. And the, I can't say for certain that worked for every single kid, uh, but he, he and, um, oh dear Lord, uh, the, the guy that uh, passed away in the middle of the year. Ian Edlin. N no, uh, oh. this was a long time ago. Washington. Uh, yes. I know who you're talking about. Can't remember the name though. Pendergrass. Yes. Uh, he and Chip worked together over many years, and I, I don't know if you've heard about the book in Olympia. No. So it's like every week or every other week, they give kids a tune. And each tune introduces like a new skill. Okay. And by the end of the year, they have this book of like 50 tunes. And it's like wheels on the bus and, you know, yeah. et cetera. Uh, but it, it, they basically made their own method book. So that by the time the kids got to Pendergrass or, or you know, Mary Jo Ridholm, mm -hmm. uh, there were a, a really clear uh, outline of what the kids would be able to do. Right. And, and that's what we want at any, whatever materials you use, mm -hmm. uh, to build that, that program of, that expectation of excellence. Yes. Uh, because in, in Puyallup, uh, when Mark Jasinski was disappeared in the middle of the year, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think was the best way to say goodbye to a, a really dedicated teacher right. and somebody that, that really cared about what they did for a living. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think it would be wrong to say that he was definitely approaching retirement and ready to go, but mm -hmm. the way it, it handled would hurt a lot of people. Yes. And yeah. including a great um, expectation of excellence out of Rogers. Um, and way back in the 80s and early 90s, he and Todd would take kids to Australia. I've seen pictures. Yes, that's, I remember that. And to offer kids that kind of opportunity in a public school setting. Yeah. And we were, we were talking earlier of how many of these kids are going to play in college. I would love it if all of the kids that go to college played with their college orchestra. And I love hearing news from uh, David Robbie at, at UW and um, from Nick Kawili uh, at Central that they have, you know, different orchestras for kids who aren't music majors, but they want to keep playing and they want to keep that passion alive, that they have a place to play. And it, it's too much to ask, you know, a pre-med student to take private lessons and be in the top. You know, that's too much. Yes. It, yeah. But it's a shame that they would just stop playing because there isn't, you know, the right group for them. Exactly. Yeah. And so anyhow, so I, I walk into um, Rogers High School as a conducting three student from PLU uh, mm -hmm. because Bruce Leonardy, what, he was doing the right thing. He was taking lessons with Kathy Johnson mm -hmm. and uh, he and Ed Powell had decided that I would come in uh, once or twice a week for the whole duration of the, of uh, kind of the end of that year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that the kids would have a, a string person and, and, you know, Bruce is an amazing musician. It, there was mm -hmm. no lack of musicianship, but there, there are string idiomatic things yes. that, that you, you just have, you know, teaching certificate or not, uh, <laughs> right. you know, like th this should be in fourth position. Yeah. Exactly. And, and there are things about trombone that, I have no idea about the Bruce Wish would be able to fix if yeah. I was put in a, a band situation. <laughs> and thank God that's only happened once. <laughs> but I was team teaching with Rick Bill, so it was a lot of fun. There you go. <laughs> uh, uh, anyhow, so when I ended up back in Puyallup and in that position where I had kind of seen the decline of of that program and when when christy stepped in christy preheim mm -hmm. uh you know it, it wasn't what mark was doing and the mistake that i made and, and it's it, not a, a huge mistake but a, a mistake that maybe a future educator out there might make and it's one that 
I think every new music educator makes when they're, they're coming to an ensemble is you're fresh out of college. You've been playing in a college ensemble. If you're like me, you're playing with, you know, pretty good community orchestras and you've maybe played a couple of professional gigs mm -hmm. and you really want to do that, you know, uh, theme and variations on a theme by uh, Tchaikovsky, by Rensky. Mm -hmm. But that's not meeting the kids where they are. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have that expectation of excellence at that level. Mm -hmm. And and maybe the, the bigger mistake was seeing that there was excellence. It just wasn't what I expected it to be. And I didn't do my due diligence to like, let's just be Christy Preheim for a year. Yeah. And if if the kids enjoy playing movie music at the last concert, let's just do it. That's that's one that I've fought for for a long time because I when I was in Puyallup, it was they'd always get one pop song or one fun song for the last concert of the year because I wanted them to learn these techniques and these this other literature. And, and that is exactly how I am. Is you, you you get one at the end of the year, but everything else is you know we got to build your technique. Right. Yeah. And so that was one of the things I walked into that I I guess I did change the first year is the whole final concert the finale concert we call them was all disney music and yeah. it was you know disney and pixar and everything just you know crammed down your throat and i'm like but the last concert is like it's the finale it is what we have accomplished this entire year and so i and i don't know if that's just me or if that's something i developed in puyallup and took with me to up but we're not doing movie music we're not doing any of this stuff and so now you know we we do you know, the best of our best music and, you know, being able to do a junior high full orchestra in Puyallup and then continue that at Curtis Junior High. Um, we finally got that. I don't know if we started it back up or got it started for the, the first time at Curtis High School. Yeah. But now that is our finale concert with the symphony because it's, it's all and we've we've done it two years in a row now. Well, not this past year because of yeah, know, obviously. online, but, um, you know, the two years prior, we just did the finale concert was just straight movie music and the kids love it. And we're buying, uh, you know, as, as close to original, if not original scores as possible, uh -huh. um, because we're lucky enough to have the funding to do that, mm -hmm. but it's attainable for the kids. They can do it. They know it. They want to do it. And then we can, you know, do it as prelude music when we go to the Tacoma Dome for graduation. You know, well, so and, it's easy and to fit in. To that end, if there are people out there that want to do a symphonic, you know, program, the people like Merle J. Isaac and, and Richard Meyer have really tastefully arranged a lot of the stuff that is, you know, not really in the capacity of contemporary, you know, school orchestra students. Mm -hmm. Like, when, even when I was in high school in 2010, you probably could have got the fourth movement of Beethoven five out of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wouldn't have been easy. Right. But yeah. it, 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 you know, when uh, John Nardalillo retired in Olympia, uh, we did the Zampa overture as a, you know, a farewell to him. Cause that was, yeah. his dad would play it on a record at night and it was like his favorite symphonic song. And mm -hmm. so um, we, we played that as a farewell to him, but that's a really hard piece of music. I yeah. mean, the triplets at the end of it from the first violin part is like, good night. Yeah. Um, but if, if your kids aren't there yet, there are so many really tastefully arranged, like the Dance of the Tumblers. Mm -hmm. There's a great arrangement of that, that even, like, cause, because of Sogo, I know about a lot of these things because they right. very uniquely do uh, symphonic music for elementary level kids. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the stuff is out there if people want to start doing that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when I was student teaching with Paula Ferguson, the one of her classes, and it's actually part of her FTE, is the the Mustang Orchestra, I think is what she calls it. Uh -huh. And it's a two day a week after school, like two and a half hour youth symphony kind of thing. Okay. And she says it's not for the kids who are in Seattle Youth Symphony. It's for the kids who will never get in. Mm. And and the kids who just like to play symphonic music. Yeah. You know, it's you know, it's not the the leftovers it's 
right. so that everybody has the chance to play in a symphony orchestra before they graduate. Yeah. And that's something that I'm trying to bring to my teaching is to give everybody that, that taste of what, you know, the highest experience in orchestra is before they move on. Yeah. And that's, yeah, it's, it is fun. And it's, it's important for them to be able to feel that and to experience it too. And when you get it going, like some of the recordings I've heard from, from you guys and Olympia at Western, yeah. uh, which one of you did Shasti five, the last movement? Wasn't us. Maybe it was Olympia, but it, yeah. it, you know, it, it wasn't Berlin Phil. Right. But you but. every kid on stage had the look on their face of, we're playing Shasti five. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and it's so much fun when the kids finally get there. You know, and and I have that music in my in my library. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know because the up until the early two thousands, the symphonic orchestra in Port Angeles was a symphonic orchestra. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, he and the uh, Ron Jones and the band teacher at the time, they had a, a schedule worked out where they would work with each other's kids a couple times a week on the the symphony music, and mm -hmm. so we we've we've got it on the shelves. It's just collecting dust right now. And uh, we've got a, a new band teacher in, uh, in Port Angeles, Jarrett Hansen is his name. And we just had a big long talk today about, you know, what's kind of our five-year plan and, you know, how, how can we make the music program better? Yeah. And, and I wonder if you might, just for a couple of minutes, I know we're, we're kind of running long on the tooth with time here. Uh, <laughs> But the way that you and your colleagues work around, how do you support the music program and not, you know, just you're the island of orchestra? Because that it really, it, you could see it as I'm doing what's best for my program and let's kick everybody else to the curb. Right. But it's not what's best for, you know, your workplace relationships. Right. Or for the kids, because you don't want the kids antagonize, antagonizing each other. No, you want a strong no, no. music department. So when you have the Christmas concert, you can do bits of the Messiah and it sounds great and it's really well prepared. And the choir is just as good as the band is just as good as the orchestra and you enjoy right. sharing those concerts. That's the yeah. ideal. So I, how, how do you navigate that? That's, you know what, it, we share offices. <laughs> we're, we're blessed and cursed that we, uh, that, I ha that I'm in two buildings and I'm two, two different offices and I share both of them with the band director. Mm -hmm. you know at each of the buildings and so there's you know that's one way is we are constantly around each other we have to constantly work with each other we share rooms we share spaces we're always there and so I think a lot of that is just you know we have to communicate we don't always get along and there's days where you know not many words are said but we know where those boundaries are like okay you know what we'll start over tomorrow um mm -hmm. but you know just being open and communicating and saying you know what okay here's the goal we're going to get the junior high ready for western this year what you know how are how is your band doing how you know how many kids do you think are going to audition for it this year you know yeah. just working together that's you know the and that's kind of i'm talking about the junior high right now um because it's a little bit different of a situation uh craig ryan is the band director there and he'll audition his students to be part of the the full orchestra at the junior high um, which is, that's the way he's always done it. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going with what he does. Um, and so, well, yeah. And he is a fantastic educator. Yes. And a great example of somebody who didn't stop playing when he started teaching. Exactly. And, and you can hear when you do an adjudication uh, of, you know, large group adjudication, you can hear whose teacher plays mm -hmm. and who maybe lets the instrument sit in the case. Because the students need to hear you demonstrate, you know, well, yep. mm -hmm. now, I am not a cellist by any means, <laughs> but you, you know that I've got a cello here in my office. And when I put a piece of music in front of them, I, I played the part on every instrument because mm -hmm. I don't want to be in that situation where a bass player, and this, this really happened, yeah, where a bass player says, oh, Mr. Rodol, this is impossible. Well, no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> and it but was the, it? Oh. the Rev Rimico by Kurt Mosier. And right at the end, everybody has these doubled eighth notes. Dugga, 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 dugga. And it's, you know, I had worked out the fingering that I, I kind of have big hands. So if you have tiny hands, I'm sorry. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is the fingering that you, that you'll do, and this is how you do it, and I'm going to show you. And yep. it doesn't mean you suck or you're bad. Uh, right. But yeah. we're we're learning this together, and it is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and it it really hurts my heart when you see a person in charge of an orchestra program that isn't a string player that didn't go out of their way to understand string playing. Yeah. And there are people who, who do that. I th Aaron Julian, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you, you'd be hard pressed to think of a lot of string educators that are really quite as dedicated as he is. Mm -hmm. And uh, groups with the demographic that he has uh, that, that play with a level of proficiency that his groups play with. Mm -hmm. So it's it it doesn't have to be that you know you played violin since you were three, right? Uh, but but even Aaron, you know, he still plays percussion professionally. He plays right. with the Yakima Symphony, and he is a really really serious musician. And as soon as you let that go, uh, it's going to show up in your teaching. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I mean, Craig is just he's like the top example of that because there yeah. there hasn't been a gig in Seattle where he isn't you know, first clarinet, or you hear, well, we called Craig, but he said no. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, yeah, there's Seattle Symphony, there's Symphony Tacoma, there's, you know, he's still a professor at PLU. Yeah. There's, you know, he, and I love Craig to death. There's some things that I can't get past, like he brings in 13 clarinets. I want you to listen to these and tell me the difference, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of I like the head. second one. Well, why? I'm not sure. <laughs> I've got a new ligature today. <laughs> yes, that too. Like, okay. Well, how do these reeds sound? I don't know. They sound like clarinet reeds, Craig. Do you hear a hissing with this barrel? <laughs> I've learned so much about the clarinet from him and, and his obsession with mouthpieces. Well, and I think, <laughs> joking aside, I think yeah. the, the students resonate with your passion for musicianship. Mm -hmm. And if if you aren't passionate about playing your own instrument, I think the it makes it harder for the kids to be. Yeah, it, it comes to a point where you know I, I've heard Itzhak Perlman live uh, over the last twenty years, like four or five times. Okay, does not sound the same as the first time I heard him in like two thousand three. Right, not the same guy. Right. Uh, and, and that's okay. You know, there, there's a time where you, you, you dial it back and you accept diminishing returns. Yeah. Uh, but he's done those gigs and you know, he's, he's still playing and, uh, I'm sure you don't let your cello just sit in a crate. Uh, no, it comes out every once in a while and I'll admit not as much as it should. The moment I took the UP job, I had to stop playing with PLU's symphony. Yeah. In that, uh, you know, as I was a Puyallup teacher, that was my outlet. You know, one day a week, uh, Jeffrey Bell Hansen would let me come and sit in the back of the cello section and, you know, heck heckle a couple college kids and <laughs> sight reading and, you know, uh, but it's still here. It's, it's in the case right now. And I keep looking over at it, like, oh, we're having this conversation, but it's, it comes out. I've, you know, you have to figure out when I went to UP, it felt like my year eight of teaching felt like my first year of actually working. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because Having the high school gig is a whole different can of worms. Well, and, and going from technically one group, I'm not counting the elementary I did in Puyallup, but, you know, one junior high orchestra to three and two at the high school, like, I'm actually, I'm working, like, nonstop, and... So, you know, when I started UP, I had to finally put the cello aside. I still kept my private studio open. Mm -hmm. because I still needed some form of an outlet. Um, and actually, as of this past school year, my private studio is now closed. And I've been teaching privately longer than I've been a public teacher. You know, I was teaching in high school. Well, and so that's, you know, that's, it's hard to get it back out of the case, but it has to get out of the case. And that was a, a conversation that, well, one of millions that James and I had over about this time last year mm -hmm. of, you know, getting ready. And, you know, I was playing with like five different community orchestras mm -hmm. because, you know, teaching junior high 
and when I was in Puyallup, I was blessed to teach only orchestra. I was lucky in that way. Um, but it, it, it wasn't really, you know, a whole program and there weren't tours to worry about and there's no boosters and there's no fundraisers, which yeah. is, you know, to the detriment of the students that they don't get those opportunities. Uh, but it meant that, you know, my evenings were pretty open and if I wanted to make a buck, you know, it was a half hour to go up to Seattle and, yeah. uh, and play and, and that was great fun. But we, we had a conversation about how many of those gigs are you going to keep? Because, you know, you, you're going to find, find out real quick that you don't have the time to do that. Yep. And uh, in my time staying with Ron Jones and his wife, uh, you know, he just kind of mentioned that if a student would say, uh, you know, I, I don't have a private teacher, but I think I want to play a solo ensemble. Can you give me a, a piece to get started on? Mm -hmm. And he'd, you know, give the kids private lessons for free every day yeah. after school. Yeah. And his wife said, you know, because they, they both worked at the high school right. at, at uh, well, Debbie retired and then sort of rehired at some point. Uh, <laughs> but he would be there until five or six every night. You know, it, that was his one gig mm -hmm. uh, was being at the high school. And that's part of how those, our predecessors built that legacy was yeah. really not doing anything else outside of the job. Yeah. And, and that has been a hard adjustment for me is giving up some of those extracurricular activities. And it's really hard to not have private students. I mean, the, the income alone, cause it's, <laughs> it's, you know, if you do what you love, you never work. Right. Yeah. And just helping another student learn to love the accolade concerto the way that I do, the way that I do. And that, Oh, I see one of your little kitty cats in the background. Yep, they're they're starting to get in their playful mode right now. I think uh, it's so, oh, it's the witching hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, anyhow, the the real takeaway that I hope that anybody watching this gets is that um, it it's kind of um, a rose with thorns taking on a a big program with an expectation of excellence. Uh, because you're going to walk in and you're not the last person. Right. And even if you do all the same procedures and you use the same repertoire lists, uh, you're just, you're not that person. And you've got to find a way to continue that legacy with your, your, your own lexicon of, of teaching and philosophy. Um, and I, it seems like the kids are, are team Grenzner at this point out, out your way. The, I'd say about 90, 98% of them. <laughs> I saw, you know, and you'll get those surprises too. You think they are one minute and, you know, they aren't the next minute, but it's, it's kind of the nature of the beast. You, you've always got to keep your eye on everybody and, you know, and yeah, you just got to keep your eyes open and, and keep the kids happy, keep them entertained, keep them doing what it is they love to do. And, and looking at, the the program as as an investment that that's mm -hmm. it it got to that point because your predecessor invested it's oh i'm just having such a hard time looking i know I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm i'm gonna show this video to sam like right away <laughs> uh, for the, the the audience out there my wife is a, a real animal lover and we've we foster kitties from time to time and, much to my chagrin, and we have about five more animals than I would like to have. Uh, these uh, are brand new to us, too. They're brother and sister. So. But I bet you're, is it two girls that you have? No, a brother and sister. So a boy and a girl. Yeah, I bet the kids girl. love the kitty cats. They do, yes. And <laughs> I'm more of a dog person, but with my wife's business in home. Cats are easy, so much easier to take care of. Yeah, well... <laughs> We'll talk about that after this weekend. <laughs> I, I am building a catio for my wife and the cats. <laughs> so we'll talk after this weekend. I, I feel your pain. <laughs> um, so I, I just got a couple of rapid fire questions uh, okay. and we'll wrap this up uh, while I've got you here. So uh, first question is as somebody who has switched positions between a program that you built up 
-hmm. and then a program that was kind of like built up for you. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I've, you know, kind of taken a similar route. Mm -hmm. And when you're in those transition points, there are pieces of music that you can rely on that no matter which school you go to, like in your darkest hour of the kids love their last teacher mm -hmm. and you're crying in your office because why don't they like me? <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're just kids and that's the only answer there is. Uh, you, you pull out that song that you know is going to make them happy. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have pieces like that and, and which ones I, are they? I, yes, I do. I have, uh, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. I've got a couple of really great pieces that I love that I rotate through every, uh -huh. every three years. So you have to. Yeah. They, the kids only play them once, but they always ask for it again and again. Um, the high school, one of them is Violis Para Orchestra. I never say it right, but yeah. that Richard Meyer piece, the kids were asking last year. And that's hey, got the violin solos, right? The double violin solo, yeah. yeah. And the, so the kids last year were saying, hey, isn't next year the year? And I'm like, uh, one, two, three. Yes, I think it is, you know. <laughs> um, another one, I can't remember the composer, but it's called The Chase. I want to say David Schaefer, but that could be wrong. Mm. Um, the Chase is one. Brian Balmage's, I could rattle off a number of his pieces. To Tame the Raging Rapids was yes. I think, the first piece that turned me on to him. Um, Point Lookout is another one of his that I do, I, I try to do every other year. That one's a difficult one for the junior high, um, mm. but we do it for Veterans Day. Yeah. Because kind of that Civil War and all the tunes in there. Um, well, a show can farewell. I'll throw in while we're at yep. it. Like that's anybody can learn that song, and the audience loves it. I did that one year in Puyallup, and I actually had a ninth grader write a duet part to the violin solo. Oh, and, they, that's... and we and I'm like, if you want to do it, do it, and we'll and we worked on it. You know, he gave me something. I said, okay, fix this, add this. You know, and and I still have photocopies of it somewhere. And um, yeah, Chopin farewell. Oh man. Yeah, there's, you know, you kind of get stuck with some composers who are your go-tos. Richard yeah. Meyer, All Mages, I think, is my number one. I went to Midwest Clinic this past mm -hmm. December oh, and totally wow. geeked out. I found him. I found Ball Mages there, and I even brought a score. <laughs> and I said, hey, I, you and I were actually emailing a couple years ago about one of your pieces. He did an amazing grade. It was like five plus for double orchestra. I think it was called A Moment for Peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did it at the high school. Um, and I had to email him cause I'm like, uh, we're stuck. Here's, you know, we're, we've recorded, I'm not sure where to go from here. It's, you know, hard to pick things out and mm. you know, would you mind listening to, oh yeah, sure. I'd love to listen to the recording and da, 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 da. And, you know, so we had That's kind the of beauty of playing music of living composers. Yeah. Yes. That was, yeah. And, and these people, they, they want to hear from you. Like, yeah. um, we, we were one of the first groups um, outside of uh, the the Texas Music Educators uh, Conference to do Red Rhythmico by okay, Composure, yeah. and you know the the kids loved the piece, and uh, we we got a showcase performance at the Mercer Island Festival uh, mm -hmm. playing Red Rhythmico, and I just reached out on a whim when I started this podcast of. Would you come on my tiny little podcast and <laughs> talk to my kids? And he said, yeah, sure. And it was super awesome. nice. And he, he took a lot of questions off camera. Uh, mm -hmm. these, these are not, you know, men in high castles hiding from us. No. And, and I think the way, well, with Brian, with that A Moment for Peace by Ball Mages, I threw it on one of the, our Facebook groups, you know, with all the teachers saying, yeah, hey, anybody hey, does it, how do you actually <laughs> set the group up? Cause I was, you know, like, that's the first thing it's double orchestra. How do you, and you can't, it even, he even wrote it in the program notes, you can't conduct everything, Yeah. Be, it, but everything happens, you know, you're kind of like doing these things. And so I just threw it out there like, Hey, has anybody done this? How did you actually set it up? I'm going through different, you know, formations in my head. He was the first person to respond. It was, Oh yeah, I know somebody who's done this. And yep. <laughs> like, the notification popped up on my phone and I screenshot it. I'm like, he's talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's my geek out moment. I got to meet him at, at Midwest Clinic and that's awesome. It's so cool to meet, you know, the person that that's that's great advice for any new teacher is uh I mean even here in Port Angeles where the stuff on the shelf is a little dusty. And uh, when I when I came in, 
uh, I decided for the first concert, everybody was going to play new music. Because in Port Angeles, a small town with a lot of bigger families. Mm -hmm. And so the, the parents in the audience are um, on their third or fourth kid in the high school orchestra. Mm -hmm. And they've heard everything. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be compared to James or, or, or Ron, because they are both such awesome teachers. And if I do, you know, the Bach G minor little fugue, not the way that Mr. Jones did it, I, I just, I can't offer, I don't want that comparison. And that's, and not, I, a good, that's not a good spot for you to put yourself in. No. Either. You can't do that. So yeah. I had just been at Birch Bay and we had read through that tune Cascade by Bert Lagon. Okay. And it's just candy. I mean, it's jazzy and it's, and it kind of sounds like, a 90s sitcom intro. <laughs> and I had had great success with the arrangement of October by Eric Whitaker. Okay. And it's got a beautiful viola solo mm -hmm. and everybody needs stronger violas. Mm -hmm. And so you, you work with the whole, the whole section plays the solo until like the week before the concert. Right. And then you, you pick the person. Um, and then Red Ritmico, which is just, you know, rip roar and, and fun. And there, everybody yep. gets a solo. Yep. Uh, and, you know, and then later in the year, I just kind of looked through the, what have they done in the past three years? And, uh, and when I'm looking at the shelf, I'm seeing a lot of like the greats that we're talking about aren't there mm -hmm. because uh, I think Ron had just kind of figured out what worked and it music budgets are what they are. And, if there wasn't a hot new piece to buy, he just didn't bother. Yeah. Uh, so they, they didn't have Forever Joyful on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And that's like one of the top three selling orchestra pieces on J.D. Pepper of all time. Yeah. I mean, right up there with Dragon Hunter. Yeah. And the, the kids hadn't heard it. I couldn't believe that they had never played it. That's funny. And yeah. uh, two days before schools closed, we played that at our, our spring concert. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad we got that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. So uh, next question is if you could think of a time when either at any point in, in your musical career, mm -hmm. when you were struggling, if you could go back in time and give your younger self a piece of advice that would have either saved you or just helped you survive the experience, what would that advice be? Ask for more help. Yes. It's not, yes, it's our job, but it, we don't have to do it by ourselves. Yeah. There's so many times where I should have called Kathy Johnson again. You know, <laughs> I, I should have called, I should have reached out to Paula Westgard. I should have flat out just texted Joel Westgard, the, you know, the first time I had an issue at Curtis, you know, things like that. It's, yes, it's our, our program and our, we're the person in charge. I'm using air quotes because it's, you know, it's all of ours, yeah. but it's asking for help is, we don't do it enough and we never ask for enough help. You know, and if the first person doesn't help enough, or if they do help, it's okay to ask another person saying, you know, continue, ask for more help. And, and I'm so grateful for the, the very specific way that Ron Jones worded it was, nobody needs to know how little or how much I help. And I'm not going to show up out of the blue but you can call me as often as you need to. Mm -hmm. And nobody has to know that it, that it was me who made that choice or helped you make that decision because mm -hmm. you, you're the guy now. Yeah. But, but I'm here mm -hmm. as often as you need me. If yep. you want me to show up, I'll show up. If you just want to talk, we'll and, and James uh, was the same way, took all of my phone calls and because, mm -hmm. I mean, he knew all the families and when I had a funny email of, out of East Jesus nowhere of <laughs> what the heck is this? It was, <laughs> you, you know, they, they put the question yeah. to rest. And, and I think it, if, if anybody's watching this, that's uh, a music educator in college, mm -hmm. I mean, the same advice applies. Yeah. 
you're not the only, you know, music ed student who's, you know, having a hard time with ed TPA. Right. I mean, that, that whole thing is just a nightmare. Well, it's, you know, it's not even just colleagues that are close to us that we, we can reach out to. It's, there's all the Facebook groups, you know, you don't know something, just post it, throw it up there. Oh, I, I love the school orchestra teachers Facebook group. I mean, that when I was in, I've told the story so many times, but when I was in DC with Rogers and they- we were all watching that thread. We were all trying to help oh, out. It was such could. a nightmare. <laughs> the tour company didn't send me, well, they didn't understand that there's a difference between band and orchestra. orchestra yep. That was the big problem. Yep. Uh, oh, good. And, and bless his heart, Stephen Picard was so understanding and- uh, <laughs> Every time our tour guy said, okay, band, Steven said, and orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but that group within about a half hour of posting anybody in the D.C. area have three cellos and two basses. Yeah. I had him. Uh, David Cho, who's one of my first guests on this podcast, he mm -hmm. showed up at Arlington Cemetery with three cellos and two basses. And, <sighs> and we played the gig. And, you know, later on, I had to take an Uber uh, back yeah. of Fox's uh, music company, and um, the guy maybe charged me a hundred bucks mm -hmm. for the, you know, yeah. and I paid it out of my own pocket just because that's what a teacher does. That's exactly and what we do. That yeah. kind of thing's gonna happen. Yep. Um, well, that that's great advice. Um, yeah. I had one more question, but it has evaporated into the ether. <laughs> Um, it, you may notice the harpsichord behind me. I do, and I've been kind of watching your your little thing about that. That is amazing. Yes. So uh, Cooper Sherry, he is a, a music director. I forget the name of the Lutheran church. It's right uh, next to the Narrows, kind of, you know, where Sven uh, lives. Yeah. It's the Lutheran church up the road from there. Okay. I can't place the name right now. Okay. It's uh, next to Truman Middle School, kind of in that area. Okay, yeah. Um, I wish I could remember. Uh, but they had a harpsichord, and he was just kind of upset about how little it was being used, and mm -hmm. he was an organ student at PLU back in the day, awesome. and just he wanted to see it be played by students. Mm -hmm. and, and that was his caveat, and I said, well, I... Because at, at the time, I was still in Puyallup, mm -hmm. and he had student taught with Dan Davison. Oh, my gosh. Okay. And so I was organizing this surprise concert where I, I wrote a piece in his honor that mm -hmm. uh, we rehearsed in secret with the choir. Mm -hmm. And Cooper put together um, the Dan's greatest hits of his warm-ups. Nice. I don't know if you ever got to watch Dan teach, but he oh. he had, like you know, the cycle of 30 warmups that he mm -hmm. used his entire career. Yep. And uh, some of them less than others. And so we, Cooper put together this, like, you know, 10 measures of each one. And Dan is just sitting there and he's crying. And now I'm crying because he's crying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but any, after the sort of after party, Cooper was saying he had this harpsichord. Mm -hmm. And I, well, I had just been offered this job Mm -hmm. out of Port Angeles, and they have this chamber orchestra, and James had kind of told me he likes to start the year with, uh, you know, Baroque music. That's uh -huh. sort of how he eases the chamber orchestra into the, you know, yeah. whatever direction they're going to go that year. Right. And we've got kids out here in Port Angeles that are great keyboard players. How many harpsichords are there out here? Zero. So you want your harpsichord <laughs> to be played by kids? I'll yeah. make it happen. <laughs> exactly. That's so, cool. And, you know, it, it's... It's not, you know, the, the best work of art, but it's, it's got all the, it's got three sets of strings and all the different stops. And mm -hmm. um, I have to tune it every other day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and twice every day in the winter. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's just another example of, of something that I learned from Paula Ferguson of mm -hmm. giving public school orchestra students the opportunity to experience everything that the classical repertoire has to offer yeah. because it might be their only chance. Mm -hmm. I remember every time at PLU, they pulled the harpsichord out. It was like <laughs> yeah. the, the first five minutes, like even while they're tuning or just dinking around on it, you just kind of sit and stare. And it's like, that is so cool. And it's, you know, when I, the rare chances I do get to play with a full orchestra or a symphony anymore, 
the first A from the oboe that I hear, I just sit there and it's just calming to me. It's like, oh, there's that sound again. This is so much fun. I'm so glad I've had this experience. Oh yeah, I need to make sure my kids can have this experience too. Well, you know? you've reminded me of what my question was now. Oh, good. <laughs> so when I was in fourth grade beginning orchestra at Rocky Ridge Elementary in Bethel School District uh -huh. with Sherry Levins, who was my private teacher for 10 years. Uh, and the first time she had all like 50 of us play the open A string. I had been huh. playing flute since I was three. Oh my gosh. And okay. because my, my mom is a pretty decent flute player. Uh -huh. And I was kind of tired of mom being my private teacher. And my, my birth dad was a band teacher. Uh -huh. And I figured nobody knew anything about violin. If I do violin, then mom and dad won't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. While I'm practicing, I can do my own thing. Uh, but, you know, it, it seemed like it was really hard, and I wasn't sure about it. And it was such a big group of people, and Mrs. Levins is kind of this weird lady with this cat sweater. <laughs> and, uh <-huh. laughs> but the first time that all 50 of us played an open A in the gym, like, like lightning, I knew I was an orchestra kid. Mm-hmm. Did you have one of those lightning bolt, like I'm an orchestra kid moments? I, uh, I'm one of three, three boys in the middle mm -hmm. and we're 17 and 18 months apart. So my older brother, he's, he's the legit nerd of the family. He wanted to play viola starting in the fourth grade because it, he knew in the fourth grade it would give him scholarships in college. What fourth grader thinks the viola? You know, he's and, what does that make you? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I'm the one that keeps teaching it, right? And so it was. It was something that was. in my my mom played the piano, but it wasn't. You know, she grew up taking piano lessons, but you know, couldn't do anything as an adult. My dad's not musical musical at all. So for me, starting the cello, it was okay. My older brother's doing this. I want to go with the big the big one. The big well, one. Well, yeah. We, well, we walked in the music store. Dad didn't want the bass because he knew he was going to have to carry it around, not me. So I picked <laughs> the next biggest, which was the cello. Um, and I don't know if there was like an aha moment that I knew I was going to be, you know, the orchestra kid and do this thing. I just really enjoyed playing it. And, and so maybe it was, maybe I just totally missed the aha moment because it happened so quick. And there wasn't like an instant. There was, there was an instant where I knew I wanted to be an orchestra teacher. Oh, okay. And that came, so I started in cello in fourth grade. When I got into middle school and into eighth grade, um, I had already been in Everett Youth Symphony for you know, a couple years, taking private cello for a couple years. Um, there was a, a moment where my teacher said, hey, will you go take so-and-so out in the hall and help him with this part of the music real quick? Mm. Like, weird okay uh sure like eighth grader you know what am I doing I have no clue went out in the hall and just helped him with it like my teacher would have helped me with something and it was so rewarding and I just I just got a kick out of it like hey let's do that again hey I'm gonna can we can we, can we you know keep doing this thing and so I don't know if I don't think I ever felt like a aha that I knew I wanted to be the musician I yeah. enjoy playing and I love the cello, but I definitely remember that aha moment when I knew I wanted to be an orchestra teacher. I knew I wanted this to continue. Now, you know, in high school, I kind of sidetracked a little bit and thought, oh, well, you know, teachers, they don't make anything. And then let's go look at this science stuff. And I actually had the opportunity through a scholarship I was getting in high school to go to uh, Fred Hutch and do kind of a uh, one or two day kind of deep dive into some some things and um it didn't pan out like right away I knew like I don't know how to gel cell gel thing like what is this and worms doing what like this is way beyond yeah I'm gonna go ahead and be a teacher because I enjoy this a whole lot more like I get this, this story is so ironic <laughs> <laughs> so the since I was in fifth grade I was gonna go to UC Berkeley and be an industrial designer <laughs> So that was <laughs> <laughs> and you know, uh, 
I went to Capital over Olympia because they had International Baccalaureate. Mm-hmm. And I, me and my mother somehow thought that that would pan out in my favor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I ended up doing Running Start and IB, bad choice. Oh. Uh, and I did one year of that and I survived. It wasn't the end of the world. And then I realized that I was getting 45 credits a year at Running Start. <sighs> and so... I just, the senior year, I just did orchestra. It was the only class I had at school. And because I was doing running start, I could go to uh, two or three of the elementary schools with Joe Divig and Uh and help him with the beginners. And uh, in a really awkward, ill-prepared way, I I once told Joe that watching him with the beginners was like really where I saw how good of a teacher he was. Because uh-huh. when, at the high school, we were all, we, we really loved Mr. Nardalillo. And when he took, he very different guy. Uh, and, and he just kind of went straight his direction. And it, it wasn't the kind of program. It was just the one orchestra. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a freshman orchestra and the 10 through 12 orchestra. There wasn't uh-huh. a, a chamber group. So he could kind of just walk in and do his thing. Right. Um, and, and, you know, he, he did great work there. And, and he got capital uh, up to, you know, a, a really respectable level, uh, mm-hmm. by the time he had moved over to Olympia. Um, but I, you don't see the teaching happening when you are the student. Right. But when I was with him in the elementary classrooms and to see the way that he would just, even the way you'd accompany on the piano and mm-hmm. start the group, it was just really captivating to me. And there were a couple of times where, I, I would get to fill in or um, I've got to go do this thing. There's going to be a sub for the freshmen. Can you get out of your second period class and, you know, work with the freshmen? Mm-hmm. And then one day in one of my, where I didn't have to go to rank start because of the schedule, uh, I, I was starting to consider maybe I'll go into composition okay. because uh, uh, Sven had really been challenging my music theory side when I started taking lessons with him and I had started taking composition lessons with Greg Utes um, because the Tacoma Youth Symphony set up a program where uh, you could take group lessons at a really reduced rate. Uh Um, And, and I was producing a fair amount of literature. I mean, a high school kid, what do you have to do at night? If you're like a nerdy orchestra (laughs) kid, (laughs) practice and write music till midnight. Exactly right. Yeah, we didn't have Netflix yet, so there was no, like, just stay up late binging shows. <laughs> Although, if you stayed up till three, you could catch Family Guy again on Adult Swim. <laughs> uh, and he was, so what are you going to do when you, when you leave high school? You know, the classic, like, Joe Divig. Yeah. Yep. You know, what do you think you're going to do? I was, well, you know, composition sounds cool. I'd really like to be a conductor. That sounds fun. And I, I had taken a couple lessons very begrudgingly from Paul Cobbs. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and now I, he's kind of loosening up on the not taking students thing. Uh, uh-huh. That's another story for another time. But uh, it was like maybe, you know, uh, maybe composition and then maybe conducting. And, and he didn't even look at me. He just kind of said it from the office. No, you're going to be an orchestra teacher. And everybody in my family is a teacher. I'm like, no. <laughs> Mr. Divic, there's no, I'm not going to do that. There's no way. I'm not going to be a teacher. You're crazy. It was, that was going to happen. And no, and so he just, no, you're going to be an orchestra teacher. And so I I never had to choose. It was just, no, you're going to be an orchestra teacher. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the conversation word for word, but that's more or less what happened. And, you know, when I showed up at PLU and I went to Dave Robbins, you know, Mm -hmm. the spiel that he gave every year to the private studio, and the, you know, his say no to other opportunities because you won't have time if you can remember that. He did I it do. every year. Yep. <laughs> and uh, Dave Hoffman gave me one of those too. And the, the, the next day uh, when they ask you to pick a major mm-hmm. and it, with no contest, music yep. education, yep. because everything else I wanted to do, I could, I could still do as a teacher or, it, and all of the experiences I had playing in like pit orchestras or just side gigs that were offered to me as a high school student really showed me 
how important it was to have a background in education if you wanted to be a conductor or a high level musician. Yeah. Because those people that don't have the background in education, they don't know how to explain to you what you don't know. Yeah. Um, so that, that's how I ended up where I am. Yep. Well, anyhow, uh, I think somehow I have hijacked this conversation about you to myself. <laughs> um, you know what? This was always about both of us because we're both in the same, we're both in the same yeah. situation. And, you know, we've both managed to, to figure our way through it and, and kind of figure it out. I, th I like to think I figured it out. <laughs> I don't well, want to say that too loudly, but, you know. <laughs> maybe two, uh, a good way we could wrap this up is uh, to both your and my students, mm -hmm. uh, what would you like them to know and understand as we enter this unknown of a school year? It's not going to be the same. We will get back to normal at some point. We don't know what we're doing. We're doing our best with what we have. Just go with us. Excuse me, there was something there. You know, come on this, this weird journey with us. We're, you know, I don't give up, trust us. That's really, I've already actually had to send a couple of those emails. I've got kids that are asking, hey, is orchestra worth it this year? And I start off by saying orchestra is always worth it. Mm -hmm. it. It is. It's even if it's the class that you take because all your five other classes are just AP and they're blowing your brains out. Take orchestra, keep it there because it will help you. Orchestra is going to be the only class that you're going to be able to have with your best friend the yeah. whole time you're in school. Yeah. Because at some point you're going to have to take different English classes mm -hmm. or you're not going to be in the same math. You're, even if you're both in Algebra 3, you can't both be in third period algebra or whatever yeah. the situation is. Different lunches. But, yeah. but orchestra is always going to be the place where you and your friend from fourth grade can still be together. Yeah. yeah. And for the, the five minutes we're playing Forever Joyful, <laughs> you don't have to think about anything else. Yep. Um, yeah. And, Trust and, us. We'll get, a, we'll get you guys through this, and we'll all come out better and stronger on the other side. And we're going to do our best to put something together that, that is worth it. Yep. And if I trust that if our students follow the, the curriculum that we put out there, mm -hmm. that when we do come back together, if, if they really double down on what we're putting out for them to do, I know that we're going to sound better than ever. Yep. That first time that we get to play together again. Yep. It's not going to be first or, you know, first rehearsal in September. It's going to no. it, yeah. be is, further along. And, and what a great opportunity to really do the deep work. When yeah. we're in class together, can you work on three octave scales mm -hmm. alone by yourself with a tuner and a metronome? But you yeah. can now, you know, so the, we've got to find the silver linings and we've got to trust each other and we've got to have kitty cats that we love. And <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Which one is that? That is the boy that is Yuri. Yuri. Yes. The good Russian kid. They're Siberian, so we went with Russian names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mila is currently playing with my shoelaces, so that's, that's going to end. Well, <laughs> Uh, on that note, thank you so much, Mr. Grenzner, for coming out and yes. talking to everybody. And hello again from, from my wife, Sam. Yeah. Uh, still can't believe the way that the, the stars align uh, you know in this it's crazy world. It's a small world. It's a small community. But thank you so much for having me. And it's always good to talk with you. Yes. And I hope educators continue to connect in this way. Definitely. We were talking about how this feels like we're first year teachers all over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, if people are watching this out in, you know, a different state, different part of the country, uh, there's always another teacher in your situation. Yep. Um, I, I didn't even know, uh, you know, Mason Flemmer, you know, Mason? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, really similar program to what we have uh, mm -hmm. with, you know, big numbers. Uh, he's got a symphonic group mm -hmm. uh, and, 
meeting him at Birch Bay gave me one more person to reach out to with, Hey, what do you do in this situation? Yeah. And, uh, and, and reach out and ask for help. Like you yep. said, because, yeah. uh, We've got the time. <laughs> yeah, we do. And we have the resources. They're out there. And, and if I learned anything from last semester, it was to have a routine, no matter how superficial it is, yep. uh, was the one thing keeping me sane. Yep. And, yep. and this podcast and my work with the students and, and finding out that orchestra still it's Always. absolutely still working. Always. All right. On on that note, we'll we'll end. Thanks so much. Yep. Thanks, David. Thanks, David.